Introduction. By the time I was five years old, it was as if I had lost my mother three times. My Spanish mother, Natividad, who gave birth to me, died of cancer and never saw me reach my first birthday. I sometimes wonder what it must have been like for her as she lay in her hospital bed and handed me back to my father or a nurse for the last time, knowing that she would never see her little baby again. I wonder what words she said to me then. I will never know, but I am sure they were words of love, and in my quiet moments I sometimes feel the whisper of her love deep within me. After my mother died, my father had no choice but to send me to live with my aunt and uncle. My two sisters and my brothers were cared for by other friends and family, whilst my father continued to work to earn money to pay the bills. I spent about a year with my aunt and uncle, and I now know I was loved unconditionally by them as their firstborn. I am extremely grateful for the time I had with them. About a year later, my dad remarried, and our fragmented family was reunited. Being separated from my loving aunt was my second early experience of loss. My new stepmother was also Spanish, and it was with her that I have my earliest memories. The first was of being stung by a wasp while collecting windfall apples in our back garden. Perhaps this was one of my first lessons, that life, in all its amazing beauty, also involves pain. My second memory of my stepmother was when I was four, and I remember placing my ear to her belly to hear my half-brother inside her womb. Little did I know that this would be the beginning of losing my mother for the third time, for as her firstborn, her new baby would be the apple of her eye and the focus of her love. I remember little of my childhood, but I know the overall picture was not a happy one. As a child, my life was scary. My stepmother was often angry, and this erupted into physical violence. I remember a time in my thirties when I was teaching a group of homeless sector employees. The topic we were exploring was abuse. Standing at the front of the room, I had written on the flip chart the different types of abuse, physical, emotional, psychological and sexual. As I stood there and asked my students to give examples of the different types of abuse they had encountered, it struck me in that moment that although I had never been subjected to sexual abuse, the rest had all been significant parts of my childhood. As you can imagine, the timing of this realisation was not ideal, and although I held back the tears, I was drawn to share my realisation with the group. I see now that this experience was guiding me towards the place where I now found myself, sharing my story with you, my vulnerability, my experiences and adventures, in the hope that it may help and also give hope to others who have been through, or are going through, challenging times. My childhood was not all dark. I have memories of wonderful holidays in Spain, magical Christmases with my cousins, wild adventures in the countryside, building dens and roaming freely with my dog, jumping off hay bale stacks, badminton games in the garden with my sister and hours of football with my friends in the village. However, as I look back, the overriding feelings that prevailed were of fear and anxiety. When I was upstairs in my bedroom and my stepmother called my name, there was always a feeling of dread. What had I done wrong? Had she found out about something? Was I going to face her cutting words, or perhaps worse? My dad was not at home much. He always seemed to be at his work, or at the allotment, or later on out running. He did his best, and worked hard to earn a living so that he could support his family. As a child, I couldn't understand why he didn't protect us from the rage and anger of my stepmother. Until recently... A frightened little boy inside me would sometimes appear unexpectedly, but I have learned over the years to be reassuring and loving with him, and he rarely shows up now. School was okay. I was an average student. I did my best, but struggled to retain information which had a big impact at exam time. As a result of what was going on at home, it's not really surprising that despite my efforts, I was always struggling to focus on my studies and I achieved only average grades in my exams. Apart from my struggle to do well in my academic studies, I am also aware I found it hard to fit in with my peers. There was a lack of belonging 
that overshadowed me in my school years. I never really felt the same as the others. Desperately, I wanted to be cool and accepted. But in order for this to happen, I always had to be false. And this did not feel good. It didn't help that my parents insisted I wear the most uncool clothes to school. Changing my clothes secretly behind some rhododendron bushes on the way to school and on my return journey became a daily occurrence. Every day I lived in fear that I would be discovered and punished for my crime. My parents never did find out. I wonder if those bushes are still there. They served me well. On leaving the sports hall where I had sat my last A-level exam, I remember saying to myself, I am finished with learning and I would never read another book in my life. The exam experience had been so stressful for me. If this was learning, then I wanted nothing to do with it. However, because I did not know what else to do, and it was expected of me by my parents, I applied for a deferred place at university, though I never really thought that I would actually attend. Even though Sunderland Polytechnic accepted me to study combined arts, my heart was set on a new type of education an education in the University of Life. At the same time I left school, my father left his job managing hospitals in Stafford to take up a new post at the Royal College of Nursing. This meant we moved to Oxford where my stepmother had family and Dad could easily commute to London. My objective now was to get as far away from my unhappy and oppressive home life as I could and as quickly as possible. Now that I was 18, I felt for the first time in my life I had real choices. I quickly found myself a job in McDonald's with the sole objective of saving money and going to Israel to live and work on a kibbutz. I worked all the hours I could and soon I had enough money for my airfare and more. Just before I left, I remember my stepmother suggested I get my hair cut and for the first time I said no to her. Even though I had been used to doing what I was told, This time I did not. My plan was to grow my hair long and wild. It was a significant point in my life, one of the many of which were to come, and for the first time I was beginning to realise it was all up to me. It was really up to me whether my hair was long or short, what clothes I wore, what food I ate, and what I did with my life. After all, it was my life now, and not that of my parents. By this time, I'd been listening to my heroes, Bob Dylan and Pink Floyd, for a couple of years already, and I'd begun to get a faint whiff of the freedom that some of their songs alluded to. So those were my early years, the day when when I was a passenger in the vehicle of my life. I know my parents did their best with the knowledge that they had at the time and in the circumstances they found themselves in. We are all products of our upbringing, and neither my father nor stepmother had an easy time growing up. I cannot imagine what it must have been like for my dad to lose the woman he loved, the mother of his four small children. It must have been tough also for my stepmother to raise four children on her own who were not hers. It's sometimes hard to understand why things happen as they do. What I do know is, it is not what happens but how we deal with it and what we learn from our life experiences and to what extent and how quickly we see the gifts in the adversity that we face. This is what is valuable to us. And that is what this book is about. It is about the adventures I have had, the challenges I have overcome and what I have learnt in the University of Life. It is about my journey from there to here. It is primarily about the lessons life has gifted me with. It is about the realisation that no matter what hand of cards you are dealt, those are the cards you have to play in this game of life. There's no point in wishing you had been dealt a couple more aces. The cards you were dealt are what you have to work with. When you realise that, you can make your own decisions and make your own choices. Then your destiny really is up to you. It is at this point you can shuffle over into the driver's seat of the vehicle that is your life, take the steering wheel firmly in your hands and decide your destiny. What you do with your precious time on this earth is your responsibility. My responsibility at this time of my life is to share what I have learned from some of my own key experiences. I will share with you my life of drugs and violence, love and separation, illness and health, struggle and pain, connection and beauty, 
and how all of these things have brought me to the privileged place where I now am. The choices we make in what we believe or think or do, they are our choices. My choices began when I climbed onto the bus heading for Heathrow Airport with my uncut hair, my rucksack and a ticket to Israel in my pocket. And from that moment on, my destiny was in my own hands.